I used to be a fundamental young earth creationist Christian. I taught young people for years that God made the earth about 6,000 years ago. According to the Bible, God created everything in six actual days. And that evolution is entirely false. Who should you always trust first, God or the scientist? God. God. That all organisms were created as they appear today. One of the arguments that I would use is that there are no intermediate fossils. And that if there were intermediate fossils, why wouldn't they show us? They being evolutionists. However, I found out through subsequent study that there are intermediate fossils, and they've been there for us to see all along. There are books and Wikipedia articles and online resources and free videos and documentaries. The only excuse one could possibly have for remaining unaware and uninformed is that they don't want to know. I would like to summarize some of the information that is freely and widely available on the subject of evolution and the fossil record, starting with the most famous human relative, Neanderthal. Now, as a creationist, I would have said that Homo neanderthalensis were just people. They may have been deformed or something, but there is nothing concrete to distinguish them from the rest of humanity. That's not entirely accurate. What? Which part? Turns out, they have a much different skeletal structure. They were shorter than we are, had stronger and heavier bones, a different shaped rib cage. almost everything was different in some way. But even more amazing than their physiological dissimilarities is their DNA. DNA is a resilient molecule, but it breaks down and becomes unstable in most fossils because of age. However, Neanderthal DNA was just young enough, around 30,000 years, for us to amplify and what we found was that Neanderthals were genetically distinct from the Homo sapiens alive today. Turns out when someone claims that Neanderthals were just people like us, they are making a baseless claim because of what they want to be true. And the same field of science that convicts murderers and solves paternity has shown this plainly and clearly. The genetic distance between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals can only be measured in hundreds of thousands of years. Hundreds of separate individual Neanderthal remains have been found all over Europe. This is not an isolated case of a deformed human. This was a population of hominids that lived tens of thousands of years ago. Another common argument made against ancient human-like fossils by creationists is that evolutionists reconstruct whole fossils from very small bone fragments such as a lower jaw or tooth. This is a claim made against the Heidelberg man who was discovered on October 21st, 1907. The Heidelberg man consisted of a lower jaw and teeth. Granted, building a whole skeleton around a lower jawbone is quite a stretch. An animal's sharp teeth doesn't tell you how it behaved or what food it ate, just that it had sharp teeth. Just as it takes a sharp knife to cut through tough vegetation. So those sharp teeth on a T-Rex would have been perfectly designed for cutting through plants. See, dinosaurs were originally designed to be vegetarians. But in 1933, a partial skull was also discovered, known as the Steinheim skull. The Steinheim skull was not complete, but was classified as being from a Heidelberg man. In 1994, British scientists unearthed a tibia bone near the English Channel from an ancient Heidelberg man, but no other bones were discovered with it. One can easily understand the skepticism toward the incomplete fossil that was seemingly hashed together from a few fragments found at different locations. But in 1997, a team in northern Spain unearthed more than 5,500 bones from the ancient Heidelberg man, now known as Homo heidelbergensis. These bones were from approximately 28 individuals and included complete craniums, skulls, pelvis, mandibles, teeth, femurs, hand and foot bones, vertebrae, and ribs. 38 various stone tools were also discovered along with their fossils. Creationists no longer use the Heidelberg man as an example of evolutionist exaggeration. Homo erectus is another fascinating hominid fossil. This species of homo walked upright, hence the name. But wait, says the creationist, this is just an ape. Well, an ape that used fire and tools. Well then it's a deformed human. That same old, tired, weak argument again. Why is it that all of the oldest human fossils we find are of deformed people? Whole communities of deformed people give it a rest. Yeah. Oh, and every time you move, 
your teeth You need it be It's a wonder that you still know how to breathe In a perfect world with no death How could there be fossils? Since fossils are a record of death No you won't I'll use my teeth then. Homo habilis is another famous known ancestor. He's the oldest known stone tool user. Apes don't use stone tools. What does the DNA evidence show us concerning Heidelbergensis, or habilis, or any other human ancestor? Absolutely nothing. DNA completely breaks down over hundreds of thousands of years and becomes impossible to study. The science of human evolution today is far more grounded in fact than most creationists are taught. Creationist knowledge on this subject is most often limited to debunked hoaxes such as the Piltdown Man and a common thought that the remaining few skulls are probably from primates, similar to apes or to humans who had birth defects, and on these grounds all fossils pertaining to human evolution are dismissed. However, a cursory study of the subject from a purely observational and neutral viewpoint reveals a very well-established fossil timeline full of established archaeological evidence. The missing links have been found. Fossils such as Homo rudolfensis, Homo ergaster, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Homo antecessor, Homo heidelbergensis, Homo neanderthalensis, Homo rhodesiensis, Homo florensiensis, among others, show a clear timeline of human evolution in the fossil record. The charge that these fossils are only primates like apes and gorillas has been easily refuted through obvious facts such as the human-like posture, social structure, use of fire, and their stone tools. The charge that these fossils are just deformed modern humans has also been thoroughly discredited because no normal modern human skeletons are found anywhere near them, and often more than one fossil of the same kind is found, often in different parts of the world. These fossils are also found in the same geologic strata. It is troubling how quickly and easily the typical creationist dismisses a whole body of scientific evidence with just a wave of the hand, without even bothering to look and ask serious questions. Look up Homo habilis or Homo erectus. Look at its skull and ask yourself, what is it? It seems that as evolution fills in the gaps, creationists will have less and less to argue about. I fear that the only thing left to do will be to completely ignore all of the evidence. Close-mindedness will be the last stand. Isaac Asimov was once scolded by a reader for proclaiming his delight that we live in, quote, a century in which we finally got the basis of the universe straight. The charge was that people have always thought that their particular scientific views were the correct ones, and they were always proven to be wrong, and that the only thing we could know for sure about our modern knowledge is that it is most surely wrong. See, this is what the evolutionists say. And by the way, they may be right. I, you know, I'm not a scientist. They could be right. Evolution struck a mud puddle, and out of that mud puddle came a fully equipped Boeing 747. <laughs> This is another argument often used against evolution, that it is only a theory, and as a theory, it keeps changing, and that the only thing we can know for sure about evolution is that what we know about it, now, is certainly wrong. Therefore, the whole theory is flawed. Mr. Asimov's answer to his critic was to point out that, quote, when people thought the earth was flat, they were wrong. When people thought the earth was spherical, they were wrong. But if you think that thinking the earth is spherical is just as wrong as thinking the earth is flat, then your view is wronger than both of them put together. He went on to say, quote, The basic trouble you see is that people think that right and wrong are absolute, that everything that isn't perfectly and completely right is totally and equally wrong. His point was that we are more right all the time. He used our scientific progress regarding the shape of the Earth as an example. First we thought it was flat, then we discovered that it was a sphere, we then discovered that it was an oblate spheroid due to gravity and the centrifugal forces of rotation. We then discovered that the Earth's gravitation was not perfectly distributed, resulting in it not being a perfect oblate spheroid, but giving it a slight pear shape. His point was that, while our knowledge is never perfect, we are less and less wrong all the time, and we progressively know more and more about less and less. This is what evolution is, a theory encompassing facts about which we know more and more all the time. Later discoveries refine, discredit, or validate earlier ones. Perhaps that is why creationists don't look seriously at the evidence, because it is overwhelming and because you can't dismiss it all. And they don't want to or need to believe any of it anyway. There are many who would interpret the word of God for us 
and use their own infallible opinions to coerce others into disbelieving what can be plainly seen in the natural world. These men set themselves up, as it were, between God and men, and yet go so far as to declare the absolute truth of God without qualification. Who should you always trust first, God or the scientist? God. God. I was initially going to wait to do a video on the flood, but since it was one of the main topics brought up in response to my last video, saying that Neanderthal were just humans from before the flood, I decided to address this first. While there are arguably more Muslim creationists than any other, I was a Christian creationist. For me, it was all about the Bible. Six literal creation days, which included days and nights before the solar system and most notably the sun, Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden, and Noah's flood. The Bible says that God created every animal after its own kind, and that shortly afterward he sent the flood which destroyed all life on earth except for the animals on the ark, who would repopulate it afterwards. There are a few glaring problems when this myth is taken as literal. The main one for me is illustrated by Madagascar. Madagascar is an island country located in the Indian Ocean off the southern coast of Africa. Geographic isolation has allowed it to be an evolutionary microcosm for 88 million years. Over 80% of Madagascar's animals are unique and not found anywhere else on Earth. This is due to the forces of natural selection and genetic mutation working over many millions of years. The plants and animals were able to evolve in isolation. If the plant and animal life that exists in Madagascar today existed anywhere else, we would find living and fossil evidence. But not only is most of the current life on this island distinct from anywhere else, the fossil evidence we find there is also very different from others of the same time period. However, the differences are less pronounced because Madagascar split from India during the Cretaceous period about 88 million years ago. For instance, Take Majungasaurus, also known as Majungatholus, a top predator. It was a Tyrannosaurus-like dinosaur, a theropod, but it was a very different animal. So if life was created all over the world before the flood, and some type of biological diversity was designed on Madagascar, that may make sense in a wishful thinking sort of way, but the flood should have destroyed all of this distinctiveness and made all life the same across the globe. But that was not the case. Before and after the flood is presumed to have happened, life is very different on Madagascar than on the mainland. Australia is another example of evolutionary change in geographic isolation. Australia is one of the most diverse countries on the planet. It is home to more than one million species of plants and animals, many of which are found nowhere else in the world. About 85% of flowering plants, 84% of mammals, more than 45% of birds and 89% of inshore freshwater fish are unique to Australia. Monotremes and marsupials, along with a host of extinct megafauna, are examples of unique animal life found only in Australia. The marsupial lion is a great example of an animal evolving to fill a niche in the environment. They lived only in Australia. Perhaps they all swam there, and all the dead ones too, because we don't find any evidence of their existence anywhere else. If, as creationists claim, after the flood, the animals migrated to the far reaches of the earth at different migratory rates, and that's how some places have very different species than others, then we should find evidence of these animals elsewhere. But with Madagascar and Australia, and many other geographically isolated areas on earth, that is not the case. At the very least, I suppose, creationists should concede that life does seem to evolve, but perhaps at a much quicker rate since it has only supposedly been about 4,000 years since the Flood. But admitting to that is unthinkable for most religious believers, as well as somewhat self-defeating, and ridiculous for most thinking people. How could the majority of the flora and fauna of these isolated places be distinct before and after a global Flood? The Flood legend amazingly claims global repopulation from a single species pair. For this claim, we must confront another serious issue, genetic bottlenecks. Now, before we knew anything about genetics, or reproduction, or, well, anything, stories and legends didn't have to take any of these pesky scientific details into account. Today we know that genetic bottlenecks present huge problems for individual species, and leave overwhelming evidence of their occurrence. 
the cheetah went through a severe genetic bottleneck during the last ice age. The inbreeding after this bottleneck is evidenced in the fact that skin grafts between unrelated individuals do not provoke an immune response. All cheetahs are almost genetically identical. Before 1492, there were an estimated 60 million American bison. In 1890, there were only an estimated 750. There are now around 400,000, but their genetic bottleneck has resulted in low genetic variation and reproductive problems. As an interesting side note, the ecological niche that bison flourished in was populated by Ceratopsidae in the Upper Cretaceous. Millions of Ceratopsids grazed in herds across North America. Over and over again, we see that animals evolved into available habitats that provided food, protection, and territory. Also in 1890, it was estimated that the population of northern elephant seal fell to around 30. This is causing reproductive problems now in the species. There are many other species that suffered similar bottlenecks, like the golden hamster and the giant panda. These events caused many problems for these species. Increased susceptibility to disease, reproductive problems, adaptability limitations. But the most relevant fact to the legend of a global flood is that these events left clear genetic evidence and most species on Earth did not go through this kind of genetic bottleneck. Notice that in most cases, these populations reduced to a small community, not just two individuals. Even a small community of 30, or even hundreds, has severe repercussions for the species and leaves behind a record in their genes. Noah's flood would have left genetic evidence. And what about extinct species? It is estimated that 99.9% .9 of all species that have ever existed are now extinct. That is an amazing thought when you consider that before we knew of fossils, the thought that extinction could happen to any species was anathema, because it was thought that since God created every animal after its kind, and that he saw that it was good, he certainly wouldn't allow them to just go extinct. That would be wasteful and, actually, quite a poor design. Perhaps Noah didn't do a very good job in collecting a pair of each species. Maybe he fudged the books and got by with only one-tenth of one percent of all species. Actually, how could the Earth support that many animals all at once anyway? Creationists almost always dismiss geologic evidence of great periods of time by saying that the geologic layers could have been laid down quickly in the Great Flood. While floodwaters do lay down sediment layers, they do not lay down the same kind of layers as geologic processes. Sediment layers in the earth, used to measure geologic time, are sorted by features like weathering, erosion, sedimentation, and radioactivity, to name a few. The KT boundary is an iridium layer under which are found all non-avian dinosaurs. Iridium is very rare in the earth's crust, but it is abundant in asteroids. How did the flood lay that down? Good question! What happened here? No, I have no clue. They're willingly ignorant. They're, they don't have an answer. I mean, they have an answer, but it's a BS answer. It's an answer that wouldn't make sense to a small child. Another key indicator in geology are volcanic ash layers. Did the Great Flood lay down layers containing different types of rock intertwined with volcanic ash? And what about the sloth? How did it travel from Central and South America to the Middle East to get on Noah's Ark and then travel all the way back again afterwards? And what about dendrochronology? This easily disproves the flood because we can trace the age of the Earth back over 10,000 years through tree ring dating using cross dating and marker years. This would not be possible if a global flood drowned all of the trees, thus stopping the production of tree rings at one point in the chronology, making it impossible to date farther back in time than this event. The sequence of overlapping marker rings would stop at the time of the flood and then start again after trees started to grow. Genetic variation between Neanderthal and Homo sapiens is calculated by comparing genetic dissimilarities to the known mutation rates in humans. The span of time necessary to accumulate this level of genetic diversity is approximately 500,000 years. It is impossible to do so in less than 6,000, and no one would propose such a thing if it weren't for a strong need to believe contrary to the evidence. Much has been made about skin color over the years, and in our ignorance we considered it a major difference between people groups. We now know that skin color represents less than 10% of all genetic diversity between human populations today. In one fell swoop, modern genetics has made our traditional view of race obsolete. 
we didn't like evolve from anything. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, how can like an African American person evolve from a white person? We're different skin. Two Africans with the same skin color can be more genetically diverse than either of them would be compared to a non-African. We now know that the human race originated in and migrated from Africa. And what about glaciers and ice ages? The last ice age alone covered most of North America and glaciers. Glaciation has established time frames of tens of thousands of years for formation and recession, and the effects glaciers leave behind on the landscape Glacial moraines, drumlins, valley cutting, and the deposition of glacial erratics are all solid evidence carved into the earth over millennia. Atolls are formed over a huge span of time, in which an oceanic volcano and coral reef gradually subside into a barrier reef island, and then to an atoll. This process takes tens of millions of years. James Hutton, in the 18th century, discovered the principles of geologic time and laid the foundation for modern geology. Geologic unconformities are the most visual and easily grasped principles. Angular unconformities form when horizontally parallel strata of sedimentary rock are deposited on tilted and eroded layers. These tilted layers are laid down long ago but were pushed upwards, eroded away, and sedimentation layers were deposited on top. This shows that no single event laid down all of the geologic layers at once. Many claim that the scientists who made these discoveries were just seeing the world as they wished to and accuse them of looking for an alternate theory to belief in God. Evolution is the idea some people have to explain life without God. Well, Darwin was a very bitter man who went into the ministry, mm -hmm. fell away, never knew the Lord, and uh, lost his daughter at the age of 12, she was 12, and became very bitter at God, and then denied his faith, and then came up with this fairy tale for grown-ups. That is not the case. Geology, paleontology, taxonomy and evolution were started often by creationists who initially set out to prove some form of intelligent design. The scientific community in Darwin's day was primarily creationist. Early geologists set out to prove the flood. Natural history, paleontology and taxonomy were solely creationist when they began, but the weight of the evidence was too great to ignore. The scientific community was forced to accept these theories and findings because all of the facts bore them out. Listen to this quote. Another source of conviction in the existence of God, connected with the reason, and not with the feelings, impresses me as having much more weight. This follows from the extreme difficulty, or rather impossibility, of conceiving this immense and wonderful universe, including man with his capacity of looking far backward and far into futurity, as the result of blind chance or necessity. When thus reflecting, I feel compelled to look to a first cause having an intelligent mind in some degree analogous to that of man, and I deserve to be called a theist. This conclusion was strong in my mind about the time, as far as I can remember, when I wrote The Origin of Species, and it is since that time that it has very gradually, with many fluctuations, become weaker. But then arises the doubt, can the mind of man, which has, as I fully believe, been developed from a mind as low as that possessed by the lowest animals, be trusted when it draws such grand conclusions? I cannot pretend to throw the least light on such abstruse problems. The mystery of the beginning of all things is insoluble by us and I, for one, must be content to remain an agnostic. Before Darwin, in the early 19th century, Georges Cuvier, the head of the Natural History Museum in Paris, led the fields of biology, geology, oceanography, mineralogy, and paleontology. He was a committed Christian and believed and taught that God created all of the forms of life. He opposed the idea that organisms evolved, but his work laid the groundwork for later discoveries that would show beyond the shadow of a doubt that all life did indeed change over time. It wasn't a takeover by anti-God warriors. It was a slow and reluctant change, even against the will of those making the discoveries. The early leaders in these fields would have loved nothing more than to prove that God created the world and everything in it, and some of them were big enough to accept the facts when they ran contrary to their own personal beliefs. And eventually, the scientific community accepted evolution and deep time based upon the evidence. Don't fall for the lie that most scientists today doubt evolution and the Big Bang. That is one of the most insidious fabrications told in creationist circles. There is so much evidence now that it's overwhelming. When I was a creationist, I read most of the literature on the subject of intelligent design. It's not hard to do. 
When I decided to look into the claims of evolution, geology, cosmology, and astronomy, paleontology, and taxonomy, and other disciplines that contradicted my opinion, I thought I could read all of the literature as well. I found out that though you can read all of the creationist literature in relatively little time, I couldn't hope to read all of the other side of the issue in my lifetime. Well, that's the thing. It's not a two-sided issue. There is no controversy to teach. The creationist viewpoint is a position of denial and poorly worded and empty arguments. The Bible says that God told Noah to bring seven of every clean animal and two of every unclean animal. Why was Noah supposed to sort the animals based on the Hebrew dietary laws that hadn't been given yet? And furthermore, there would have been no reason for clean and unclean distinctions because they apparently didn't eat meat before the flood. Near the end of the Old Testament, there are many names, dates, times, and places given. Many tedious details are listed ad nauseum. But the farther back in the Old Testament you go, less and less details are given and more and more generalizations are made. This is because the Old Testament was compiled a few hundred years BCE by Jewish religious scholars compiling oral Hebrew myth into a comprehensive collection for the purpose of religious observance and national solidarity. The accounts of creation and the flood in the book of Genesis are stories, of which lessons can be gleaned, but that's all they are. Once you see that, all of the scientific evidence, all of a sudden, makes sense. Your brain knows exactly what type of animal this is. There is nothing on earth quite like the elephant. Well, not anymore, that is. There have been many elephant-like animals, collectively known as the order of Proboscidea, of which one living family remains, Elephantidae. And looking at the various ancestral forms, we can see evolution happening with our own eyes. Evolution happens by slow, gradual changes to an organism, generation to generation. These changes accumulate over millennia and eventually cause significant differences in speciation. Most creationists use the, but it's still a dog, argument to explain away observed evolution just because in their minds it isn't enough change. They don't see an elephant evolving from a hippo or something, so they dismiss it. Okay, so they have different tusks and skeletal structures. They're still elephants, right? At what point do we admit that it is so significantly different from modern-day elephants and accept that they evolved? This particular form of creature evolved quite distinctive ways of feeding. One was to take his mouth to his food, but the successful one that remains today is the one where he brings the food to his mouth. It makes your brain hurt just to look at them like this. It is understandable that the mind has trouble accepting that the elephant evolved from an animal that looks almost nothing like it. But when you see the steps, the gradual change over time, how each species was so similar to the one before it, but that if you go back far enough, you see easily how these small changes eventually made big changes. Evolution happens. We can see it. Attention needs to be drawn to the fact that most of the professional creationists out there are outright lying to you. I used to be a young earth creationist. I taught it in church and to youth groups. You may be surprised to find out that one of the major factors in my leaving this particular belief system was the creationist leaders themselves. In this video, I would like to outline some of the lies, dishonest tactics, incompetence, and inexcusable ignorance of those who had set themselves up as leaders who had cast aspersions on genuine knowledge. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubblegum. What have you understood that Darwin taught? Well, Darwin was a very bitter man who went into the ministry, mm -hmm. fell away, never knew the Lord, and uh, lost his daughter at the age of 12, she was 12, and became very bitter at God, and then denied his faith, and then came up with this fairy tale for grown-ups. Watching hours and hours of videos of these people talking has been my own personal hell for days now. This it has been so difficult, I can't even begin to... Anyway, okay, Ray Comfort. <clears throat> Firstly, Darwin was not a very bitter man. He was a loving husband and father. He cared very much about the fact that his wife was a believer and he didn't want to cause her any grief. He held back publishing The Origin of Species because he feared the social pressure. He likened it to confessing to a murder. That's the same kind of thing that I felt when uh, 
deconverting from my faith. By all accounts, he was conflicted and lost his faith gradually and reluctantly. This was due to a study of the facts of nature and not due to some falling away. Who was Ray Comfort to say that Darwin never knew the Lord? Darwin was a committed Christian. He believed in God and creation. He supported Paley's arguments. Ray just made that up. This is typical of the religious fundamentalist who labors under the delusion of absolute knowledge. Not only does he just know what's true and false, he can extend that to knowledge of any given person's inner struggles. It is called self-projection as God. That is the engine that drove the Dark Ages. It's people who thought like Ray that burned witches. They just know that the woman is a witch, and God's law says that we shouldn't allow them to live. And who talks more about God's law in the Old Testament than Ray Comfort? Darwin became bitter after his daughter's death and made up evolution as a story to get back at God? Well, that's a bold-faced lie. Who knows what toll the death of his daughter took on him? Most likely a heavy one. But it had nothing, nothing to do with the theory of evolution by natural selection. Darwin was made fun of for his religious views while aboard the Beagle. He studied the natural world and came to these conclusions years before the death of his daughter. Furthermore, he didn't even publish until many years after she died, when he found out that Alfred Russell Wallace was about to publish similar findings. Furthermore, he didn't lose his faith at once. He says that it was very gradual over the course of many years, and he didn't hold up evolution as a substitute for belief in God. Ray Comfort is the one who sounds bitter. He's making all kinds of things up for the sole purpose of slander. The damage happens when pastors and preachers hear these things, tell their congregations, and whole swaths of creationists then mistakenly hold these statements to be true. Ray didn't mention any of the real reasons why Darwin was convinced of evolution. He didn't mention natural selection. He didn't mention all the animal species that Darwin examined and collected. He didn't mention the mountains of evidence that had been gathered since. He is supporting the false belief that there is no evidence for evolution. But is he just ignorant? Does Ray Comfort just know nothing about Darwin and evolution? Well, yes and no. Ray led a campaign to hand out anniversary editions of The Origin of Species on college campuses, and the 40-plus page introduction that he included with the book said all these things. That by 1838, Darwin's theories were largely formed. That he didn't publish because of some vendetta against God, but due to finding out that he was about to be scooped, and the encouragement of his friends. Even a clear timeline of his life was included, showing that he formed these theories based on evidence and study, and that it had nothing to do with his daughter's death. That he truly believed in God and the Bible, nothing to indicate his faith was anything but genuine. And all of this introduction was written by Ray Comfort. Maybe Ray knows better now, but that doesn't excuse that level of ignorance in someone who is considered an expert. He made up all kinds of nonsense and pretended to be informed. He pulled the wool over the eyes of many who would look no further into the facts. Attention needs to be drawn to the fact that most of the professional creationists out there are outright lying to you. I used to be a young earth creationist. I taught it in church and to youth groups. You may be surprised to find out that one of the major factors in my leaving this particular belief system was the creationist leaders themselves. In this video, I would like to outline some of the lies, dishonest tactics, incompetence, and inexcusable ignorance of those who had set themselves up as leaders who had cast aspersions on genuine knowledge. Buddy Davis, who will henceforth be referred to as Buddy Buddy, is one of the worst creationists for exaggeration and bad information. Hideous talk singing notwithstanding. <laughs> the very first death was a result of man's rebellion against God. So, there couldn't have been any fossils until after sin. Because to have fossils, you've got to have death. So, the theory just <coughs> falls apart. Oh, okay. He just disproved evolution right there. Wow. 
So there aren't any fossils, or they're not real, or the devil put them there. Uh, or does he think he just proved that fossils are only less than 6,000 years old? I can't even... An animal's sharp teeth doesn't tell you how it behaved, or what food it ate, just that it had sharp teeth. Just as it takes a sharp knife to cut through tough vegetation. So those sharp teeth on a T-Rex would have been perfectly designed for cutting through plants. See, dinosaurs were originally designed to be vegetarians. T-Rex ate grass. You couldn't be more... F I couldn't figure out whether to put this under lying or incompetence. It's really both. I can't even describe how angry I was watching these videos over again. These people are deliberately sabotaging centuries of hard-won knowledge and damaging the minds of children for money and religious conformity. There are major differences between the teeth of herbivores and carnivores, and that's so obvious that it's too frustrating for me to outline those differences right now. Even as far back as the 17th century, not the 17th, the 18th century, Cuvier could tell whether an animal was a carnivore or herbivore by a single tooth. That is why he was convinced that animal forms were created, because he could take a single bone and see how it was optimized for survival, the major factor being gathering and consuming of food. He could tell by a single tooth if an animal ate meat or vegetation. Hundreds of years, people. We've known this stuff for hundreds of years. People like Buddy Buddy want to wind back the clock and take us back all the way to the days of ignorance. They didn't even know what was involved in the act of breathing back then. These people won't be happy until the church rules over science again. I can't even express how frustrating this is. Imagine if you had to study reams of video of smug flat earthers who were teaching children that the stars were only a few thousand miles above the earth and that modern medicine was all lies. That's how I feel right now. It's always been difficult for me to be verbose over the obvious. I would find it nearly impossible to make a 10 minute video explaining why 2 plus 2 equals 4. Now some people say that so-called prehistoric creatures such as dinosaurs didn't live at the same time as man. Such creatures died out millions of years before man came around. But how do they know this? How do they know? What do you mean how do they know? They say how they know. There have been hundreds of years and an uncountable number of publications and videos and speeches and books. This question is the same as asking, how do they know germs cause disease? But do you know that what he's been taught is not a fact? <laughs> the very essence of science is curiosity. Asking questions, finding out the answers. Kids are fascinated by the answers. But these questions are meant to be the answers. They're meant to stop curiosity and inquisitive questions. It would be okay if a small child asked, how do they know? Or better yet, be specific, how do they know carbon dating works? There are very good answers, ones that touch on unbelievably cool aspects of the natural world. Fossils and geologic processes, paleontology and ancient ecosystems, radioactivity and atomic theory, genetics and the inner workings of DNA. We live in the most amazing time in human history, the time when we can have the answers to these questions, and the answers are more amazing than we could have imagined. But these people, would erase all that with a sneering question and religious dogmatism that we should have left in the Dark Ages. Did you know that some paleontologists actually found some red blood cells and partially fossilized T-Rex bones? Do you realize what that means? Uh, 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 yeah. Only that those bones couldn't be millions of years old because red blood cells don't last that long. And here come the lies like an avalanche. No red blood cells were found. The consensus after a battery of tests and examinations is that it was bacterial sludge that was boiled out of the fossils. But you won't see Buddy Buddy retracting any of this. Nope, he's making too much money off of the videos. What an adventure it was that we were searching for frozen dinosaur bones and God was so good to us, we found and brought back over 200 pounds of dinosaur bones, 200 pounds of dinosaur bones here to be unfossilized. What an adventure indeed. Yeah, but how can bones be unfossilized in millions of years old? That's just it. Dinosaurs aren't millions of years old. He outright lies to children here. He says that he has unfossilized dinosaur bones. This would be the biggest news in the history of paleontology, maybe in all of science. He would become famous, rich beyond his wildest dreams if this was true. But he hasn't produced these bones. 
and his lie is left in this children's video to pollute the minds of children for money. What a scumbag. But Scaly, if it really happened that long ago, how can they be sure of anything? They weren't there. But how do they know this? I mean, were they there? Science can't deal directly with the past because the past can't be observed. That's because they dig up bones in the present. Were you there? They repeat this over and over like it means something. This is one of the biggest lies of all, that science can't deal directly with the past. By just shaking their heads and repeating no, 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 they attempt to invalidate every branch of science and scientific discovery that has anything to do with the past. Forensics and crime scene investigation, specifically genetics and DNA and what it can tell us about interrelatedness, and past events recorded in genes, astronomy and the speed of light by which we know that we see galaxies as they were millions of years ago, all earth science, especially including geology and plate tectonics, paleontology, we find bones, that, but we can never know anything about them, so don't ask. Biology, genetics, laws of inheritance, adaptation and evolution, radioactivity, specifically radioactive decay and, well, everything we've learned about atomic theory, cosmology and everything we've learned about the universe, not to mention the fact that time is relative to the observer. These pseudo-scientists want to take us back to a Newtonian worldview or pre-Newtonian worldview. Your brain knows what this is a missing link for. Ever since we were small children, we've learned to identify the giraffe. The giraffe is an even-toed ungulate, along with pigs, camels, antelope, sheep, goats, and cattle. Why did the ancestors of the giraffe look so much different? Each new generation of living thing is born slightly different than the previous. Any difference that can be used as an advantage is passed on more readily, because that organism is slightly better suited to reproduce and feed. This causes very slight changes from generation to generation, but results in significant differences over great periods of time. Creationists constantly repeat the mantra that no missing links have been found, but this is just a lie, one based on either willful ignorance or outright deception. The fossil record shows us histories of various species, families, orders, and classes of animals. Using this information, we can often trace back modern-day animals to a common ancestor. Not only is this information readily available, but it is fascinating. As we look back into the fossil record, the ancestors of the giraffe have shorter and shorter necks, as we would expect. But usually, if you show these fossil species and not-so-missing links to creationists, they will school you in a master class of denial, shaking their heads, saying no, 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 bringing up all kinds of personal beliefs and ideas based only in wishful ideology. But the pictures speak louder than any baseless assertions. It is a relief to be able to accept the evidence, instead of always having to explain it away in order to make it fit with a personal belief system. When the subject of evolution, or the Big Bang, comes up anywhere near creationists, you must quickly get out your poo shield because the shit's about to start flinging. They'll call it nonsense and ridicule the ideas in a tone that you would expect if you suggested that the world was flat after all. Ha! The Big Bang is stupid. Science is wrong all the time. Blah, blah, blah. The most important question to ask them is something along the lines of, please explain your understanding of the Big Bang, or please explain your understanding of evolution. I have never come across a young earth creationist that had an accurate knowledge of either theory. You can't criticize something if you don't know what you're criticizing. My personal theory on why we never hear from young earth creationists who are informed about evolution and the Big Bang is that those creationists who really went and studied the facts to actually learn what it's all about were convinced by the simple truth of it and are no longer staunch young earth creationists. Or at least, they learned that they need better arguments and they couldn't find any, so they became less vocal. One quick note for clarity. The Big Bang and evolution are two separate and distinct theories that don't rely on one another to be true themselves. You can accept evolution and not the Big Bang, and I say accept because it's not about belief, but acceptance of plain facts. The leading theory before our current Big Bang model was that the universe was cyclical, expanding from a singularity and then collapsing under the influence of gravity to start the whole system over again. This was a slick theory that answered the question of where the universe came from. It was a simple, elegant answer. The universe was always here, cycling on and on into infinity. If, as many uninformed people claim, that science is just making things up and sticking to theories because of ideology or hatred of God, why would science give up such a convenient theory that wrapped everything up in a nice bow 
in favor of some nebulous one-time Big Bang that will expand and dissipate. A uh, one-time deal. All of the questions that were answered by the previous theory would have to be faced again. Why is there something rather than nothing? If the universe doesn't cycle, then where'd it come from? It seems implausible that it would appear out of nothing. Until the early 20th century, galaxies were commonly known as spiral nebulae, and mostly thought to be as close to Earth as other nebulae. This point was debated for almost two centuries, until Edwin Hubble and others laid it to rest. The scale of the universe was starting to come into focus. Hubble then made one of the most important discoveries in astronomy, redshifts. Here I read from the June 14, 2012 issue of Nature. Quote, a central observation in astronomy is that distant galaxies are moving away from us and from each other with a speed that is proportional to their distance from Earth. In other words, the farther away they are, the faster they are moving. Because the speeds of galaxies can be measured from the Doppler effect, which shifts the galaxy's light to the red end of the electromagnetic spectrum, their distances can be determined using the constant of proportionality between speed and distance, known as the Hubble constant. This central observation, called Hubble's Law, is crucial evidence for the now accepted view that the universe originated in a Big Bang as a tiny, unimaginably dense entity that has been expanding ever since. What's more, it provides astronomers with a neat way of determining the distances to objects, which would otherwise be impossible using only the objects' observed positions in the sky. Unquote. The use of redshift analysis allows astronomers to gather three-dimensional data from only one viewing direction. I received this message from another YouTube user the other day in regards to my question to him as to why, if a god created everything, did he make it look so old? He said, quote, As for age, it seems strata dating, radioactive dating, and redshift of light from stars all have assumptions that may not be true. Unquote. The thing is, he's exactly right about assumptions that may not be true, but the mistake is using that position as a conclusion. It should not be the end point of inquiry, but the beginning. What underpins these assumptions? What logical conclusions were used in their formation? What facts were used to build the theory? Another common criticism of the Big Bang is the misunderstanding that it claims that something came from nothing. That is not what the theory states at all. There is no such thing as nothing. What we call empty space is a boiling, bubbling mess of subatomic particles popping into and out of existence according to the laws of quantum mechanics. What the theory actually states is that something came from the quantum fluctuations in empty space. That is far from nothing. Which brings me to the point. The science journal Nature for the 14th of June 2012 ran an article in a corresponding study titled Reconstructing the Third Dimension and Big Bang Tomography as a New Route to Atomic Resolution Electron Tomography. Now, I'm not a scientist and I don't pretend to understand everything in the article, but what they are saying here is that they are directly importing the scientific methods of Big Bang cosmology and applying them to scanning electron microscopy in order to determine the three-dimensional positions of atoms from images taken from a single viewing angle. And it works! This is a stunning validation of the science that underpins our understanding of the universe at large, and more directly the science that lies at the heart of Big Bang cosmology. How do we know that the assumptions that underlie the theory are sound? Because they are constantly tested and applied, and now they are applied outside of cosmology and externally validated. One by one, the uninformed criticisms against science made by desperate ideologues are being knocked down before their very eyes. The next time someone tries to tell you that the Big Bang is not science, calmly refer them to these articles in Nature and watch them squirm. The most common reaction that creationists have when their cherished views are challenged is the mocking question. Oh yeah? Well, how did the Big Bang create itself then, hmm? <laughs> oh yeah? Well, no one has ever observed one kind of animal evolving into another. Oh yeah? Well, if we evolve from monkeys, then why are there still monkeys? They can't just discuss and debate the issues, both because they are not willing to consider any facts presented to them and because they believe that they have all the answers anyways. Take, for instance, this interaction between Aaron Ra and a creationist. Evolution right now, give me evidence. What do you want me to do? Give me evidence for evolution okay. right now. You are Think how silly you are. Me. Do you understand that? That's not evidence for evolution. How is You're it making not? a statement. You're not giving any evidence for evolution. I'm giving you evidence for evolution. You are a primate. How do you explain That's not evidence for evolution. It is certainly... 
They are so used to holding to a simple belief system that has simple soundbite answers to everything that if someone can't just quickly summarize a complex issue into a one-liner that a child could understand, they mock and ridicule and take it as a confirmation that their opponent was left speechless. It is only a confirmation of their simple mindset. What if that was their approach to every subject? For instance, prove general relativity and time dilation to me right now in simple terms. Ha! I didn't think so. If they were willing to take the time to look at the evidence, they may learn something. Okay, so how is being a primate evidence for evolution? Arnra had a very good point, but that point needs to be backed up with data, and no one just carries around the information and studies that prove it, and I doubt very much that those creationists would have sit long enough to look at it anyway. I don't think they ever do. Most people, even creationists, wouldn't have a problem with the fact that bonobos and chimpanzees have a common ancestor. They wouldn't even need to see corroborating evidence. Again, I doubt they would care. Their external similarities alone are usually sufficient. And all of the evidence does indeed show that they have a common ancestor. We sequence their genomes and can see exactly how closely related they are. Again, it's the, well, it's still a dog creationist anthem. Bonobos and chimps are more closely related to each other than one of them is to a mouse or an elephant. No surprises there. But what about us? We were specially created on the sixth day of creation by the war god of the ancient Hebrews out of the dust of the ground, right? We are definitely not related to primates. Our similarities are just coincidence. It's a common designer, not common ancestry issue here, right? I mean, we're talking about the almighty god of the universe. He, we wouldn't expect him to just copy-paste chimp DNA when he's specially creating someone in his own image, right? Well... As it happens, we've sequenced the DNA of all three, humans, chimps, and bonobos, and the results were published in the issue of Nature for the week of June 28, 2012, and here they are. It's like sitting in the chair of a talk show and being shown through DNA testing that you are, in fact, the father. You may deny it and shout and cry, but there it is, on paper, for the whole world to see humans, chimps, and bonobos had a common ancestor. We apparently weren't created separately like the Bible claims, but somehow we're all grown from the same genetic template. Ah, but we still have to deal with that pesky common designer not common ancestry problem that keeps buzzing around the creationist dogma like flies around a dead horse. How Darwin's theory pictures the history of life as a tree, with species gradually evolving into others over millions of years, producing new branches and twigs a process that gives rise to all the variety of life, from bacteria to Darwin's finches to ourselves. But intelligent design takes a different view, as the movement's own literature shows. Intelligent design teaches a history of life in which organisms appear abruptly, are unrelated, and linked only by their designer. While drawing separate species on a graph with straight, non-intersecting lines as if they were specially created does accurately represent the way young Earth creationists would like it to be, it does not accurately reflect the data that we have. Many animals have the ability to synthesize vitamin C without directly ingesting it. This is because they possess a gene that enables this function. We, on the other hand, cannot synthesize our own vitamin C and must ingest it directly from fruits and vegetables or we will die. This hasn't been too much of a problem for humans, because our diet includes a good deal of plant matter that is rich in vitamin C. When we found out exactly which gene in these animals are responsible for the function of vitamin C synthesis, we looked at the exact same location in our genome, take note, the exact same location in the genome, that directly corresponds to vitamin C synthesis gene in other animals, and what do you think we found? The vitamin C synthesis gene, only it had been deactivated through accumulated mutations. These leftover genes are known as pseudogenes, or fossil genes. Great apes, such as chimps, gorillas, and macaques, have extra strong muscles attached to their jaws that provide them the extra bite force necessary for their survival. These muscles are expressed by a gene called MYH16. Humans do not have these extra strong muscles attached to our jaws, but you guessed it, we have the gene for them. The exact gene that our great ape relatives have, and ours is switched off by a point mutation. It sits there, unused, in your genome right now, a relic from your ancestors. Creationists would have to claim 
that not only did the creator borrow from the primate genome to create man, remember primates were created first, but also would have to believe that this creator placed descendant markers in the genome as if humans and primates shared a common ancestor. The more facts that are learned make the case for evolution progressively clearer and easier, but make the creationist case harder and more convoluted all the time. Fossil genes are, in my opinion, the most amazing evidence of evolution we have today. Take, for instance, the genes controlling our sense of smell. It has been discovered that fully 3% of our genome is devoted to genes for detecting different odors. We have around 1,000 genes devoted to our sense of smell. Many mammals rely on their sense of smell to survive. Dogs are well known for the, their ability to track scents. However, when we sequenced the human genome, we found something amazing. Even though we humans have all 1,000 plus genes for scent, a full 300 of them are not utilized. Further than that, those 300 genes have been rendered inactive by mutations. This is due to natural selective pressures relaxing when a function is no longer needed for survival. The mutations that would be selected against in a necessary function just accumulate until the gene function becomes impossible. Now in nature, there are two kinds of olfactory genes. Ones that enable detecting odors in the water and ones that enable detection of odors in the air. As expected, fish have water-based receptors and mammals have air-based ones. However, we see something quite amazing in dolphins and whales. Instead of having water-based odor genes, as we would expect with animals that live in the water, they have air-specialized genes. But the catch is they don't use their nasal passages for smelling. They've adapted it as a blowhole. The result is that while they have all of the mammalian air-smelling genes, every single one has become non-functional. The record of their land-based mammalian ancestry is written in their genes. If dolphins and whales did not evolve from land-dwelling animals but were specially created as sea creatures, why did this creator include a full complement of non-functioning mammalian air-based olfactory genes? To retain a young earth creationist belief in the face of this evidence, you would have to deny it outright, which would be tantamount to retaining a belief that the earth is flat in the face of pictures from space to the contrary. Or you would have to believe that the intelligent designer wanted to make it look like everything evolved. That he planted a record of evolution in nature to fool us. And that's why the more we study, the more evidence we find in support of the theory of evolution. In that case, I would pose a simple question. If God wrote the story of evolution into the very fabric of our being, how then could you blame anyone for believing it? One of the most common criticisms of evolution, made by creationists, is that scientists just make up millions and billions of years in order for what they call microevolution to have enough time to produce macroevolution so there's enough time for one organism to turn into another. We won't go into how these are false terms and that it's all just evolution. We also won't go into how this one kind of animal turning into another is also a false idea because everything is in a constant state of flux and there is no such thing as a kind. But as for deep time, it is not imaginary. It is something you can see with your own eyes. It is true that evolution needs great spans of time to bring about significant changes, and that is where the evidence for deep time comes in. In this video, I'm going to talk about only one aspect of deep time, but in my opinion it is the clearest and most amazing one, something creationists call the starlight problem, cosmological distance and the speed of light. First a little groundwork. It is important to get an elementary grasp of the scale of the universe. The speed of light is the most important factor in understanding the cosmos. It is a constant and always has been. Many creationists desperately try to claim that the speed of light was faster in the past, but there is absolutely no evidence of this, and it is ridiculous to even consider it, and to twist the fundamental laws of the universe to save your particular belief system is quite pathetic. The moon is approximately 378,000 kilometers from Earth. That means it takes light about 1.3 seconds to travel that distance. It takes light a little over eight minutes to reach us from the surface of the sun. This is a very important point. When you look at the sun, you are looking eight minutes back in time from your relative position in space. If you see a CME, it actually happened eight minutes ago. Pluto is almost six billion kilometers from Earth. The New Horizons spacecraft will arrive there on July 14, 2015. Due to the speed of light, when we look at Pluto through a telescope, we see it as it was approximately five and a half hours ago. And here's where we really start to reach out. The closest star to Earth is Proxima Centauri, 4.2 light years away. If this star exploded right now, it would take 4.2 years for us to see it. We would be effectively looking 4.2 years into the past. The star Fomalhaut is about 25 light years away. 
orbits about 236 trillion kilometers. This is the star around which the first extrasolar planet was discovered, imaginatively named Fomalhaut b, about three times the mass of Jupiter, and with an orbit of 872 years. When we look at this system through the Hubble telescope, we clearly see where this planet is in its orbit. However, because it takes the light from this system 25 years to reach us, we see it not as it is now, but as it was 25 years ago. It really is like looking back in time. We know Fomalhaut is 25 light years away because we can directly measure it using parallax. The Helix Nebula is 650 to 700 light years away and spans approximately 2.5 light years. We are seeing it as it was about 700 years ago, at the beginning of the Renaissance, before the telescope was invented. The Orion Nebula lies approximately 1500 light years away. Because of this great distance from Earth, we see it as it was about 1500 years ago, shortly after the fall of the Western Roman Empire in the time of King Arthur and Muhammad. As a side note, the Orion Nebula lies about halfway out to the maximum distance we can realistically measure using parallax. So far so good for the creationist. All of these objects are within 6,000 light years from Earth, and so all of the events we see within this radius happen within their worldview. But you know we can't stop there. In 1054 AD, Japanese and Chinese astronomers recorded a new star which was so bright it could be seen in the daytime for 23 days. What they witnessed was the rare event of a close supernova, one that would create the Crab Nebula. One of the most amazing facts about their discovery was that they were seeing an explosion that happened in the distant past about 6,500 years before. That is because the star that exploded was about 6,500 light years away. They saw an explosion that happened in approximately 5446 BCE. The Crab Nebula has continued to expand over the last 950 plus years to about 10 light years across. It continues to expand at about 1800 kilometers a second. It appears to us to be about 10 light years across, but we see it as it actually was about 6,500 years ago. If it continued to expand at its currently observed rate, it would actually span about 39 light years in its current position. What we see as the nebula is the matter that composed the body of the star, which was flung out into space during the massive explosion. How can we be seeing events that happened that long ago if everything were created 6,000 years ago? This is what creationists loosely call the starlight problem, and it sure is a problem for them. They have created this imaginary 6,000 light year bubble around Earth where events actually happen, but outside of this faith line, just past 6,000 light years, what we observe isn't really happening. It's just a movie created by their intelligent designer. Stars explode, galaxies merge, light bends, but it's all an illusion? They call it creation with the appearance of age. This is like claiming that we all just popped into existence five minutes ago with memories already formed and hair that needed cutting. How could you prove otherwise? Everything just popped into existence a few minutes ago with the appearance of age. Just like their desperate and dishonest attempts to claim that the speed of light could have been different in the past, it's a cop-out. Creation with the appearance of age is a useless hypothesis. It gets us nowhere and provides us no useful framework for anything but propping up a religious belief system that is contradicted by the evidence. As Neil deGrasse Tyson says, this kind of religious apologetics halts inquisitiveness and scientific progress. Here are some of the coolest astronomical facts I missed out on while I was a creationist. The planetary nebula NGC 2818 is about 10,400 light years away. Planetary nebulae are formed when a star runs out of fuel to sustain nuclear reactions in its core. It then sheds its outer layers in these spectacular formations. In 2002, a spectacular outburst was observed that had never been seen before, and has been characterized as being somewhat similar to that of a nova. V838 Mon lies approximately 20,000 light years away at the edge of the Milky Way galaxy. This means that we observed an explosion that took place 20,000 years ago, around 18,000 BCE. Early astronomers classified globular clusters as nebulae or stars because telescopes were not powerful enough to reveal that globular clusters are actually composed of many stars. NGC 2808 is one of our galaxy's largest globular clusters, composed of more than a million stars. There is debate among astronomers whether NGC 2808 was formed as part of our galaxy, or if it was a captured dwarf galaxy. It is thought that Omega Centauri, another massive globular cluster in our galaxy, which contains about 10 million stars, is indeed the remnant of a dwarf galaxy. Studies have indicated the presence of a black hole in its core. M75 is one of the most densely populated globular clusters known and has a radius of about 67 light-years. 
globular clusters stick together because of their strong gravity, and the orbit of galactic core is a single unit. Remember, this is how far back in time we are looking when we observe these objects, because it took the light that long to reach us. And these are all inside our own galaxy. The Milky Way itself is approximately 100,000 light years across, and from Earth, the core of the galaxy is approximately 30,000 light years away. It is estimated that the Milky Way is home to between 200 and 400 million stars. These are estimates based on calculations from our sideways viewpoint, considering the fact that we can't see all of the stars. There is also debate on the inclusion of brown dwarf stars in the official count. We've also started to discover extrasolar planets. It seems that many stars, if not most, are orbited by planets. It seems likely that there may be more planets out there than stars. It is estimated that the maximum extent of the Sun's gravitational field is about two light years, and the distance between our Sun and the nearest stars is four or more light years. When you consider how many stars comprise the bands of our Milky Way, and the great distances between those stars, then you easily see how a galaxy like ours can be 100,000 light years in diameter. Our Sun, together with the whole solar system, is orbiting the galactic center on a nearly circular orbit. We're moving at about 250 kilometers per second, and need about 220 million years to complete one orbit. Our lives are timed in seconds and minutes, hours and days, years and decades, but the universe runs on a much slower clock. When you look into the sky, you are seeing the same stars that your human ancestors gazed at. They are the same throughout your whole life. What you don't see is that they are not the static decorations of the heavens that they appear to be, or that the writers of ancient religious texts claimed them to be. They comprise a huge machine that moves on a cosmic time scale. The cosmos is a gigantic time machine that allows us to look into the far distant past. From our galaxy, we move outward into the further blackness of space. Compared to the distance between galaxies, the distance between the stars seems small by comparison. We quickly move into the realm of hundreds of thousands of light years. Remember, it takes hundreds of thousands of years for the light from the closest galaxies to reach us. If you were on a planet about a hundred light years away from the Earth, you would be detecting Earth's first radio broadcasts. From your point of view, it would be the early 1900s on Earth. You would be able to hear in real time the outbreak of World War I. The Milky Way is a number of satellite galaxies ranging from 42,000 light years for the Canis Major Dwarf Galaxy to over 820,000 light years for LEO 1. The Large Magellanic Cloud orbits the Milky Way at about 180,000 light years away. Many diffuse nebula, planetary nebula, and other spectacular astronomical features have been observed in the LMC. It is close enough for our most powerful telescopes to resolve many of its features. If any doubt lingers as to the distances ascribed to the local group of galaxies, it turns out that those doubts were put to rest by an amazing discovery made in 1987. That year, a supernova designated SN 1987A was observed in the LMC. This star had a large circumstellar dust ring surrounding it. At the time, we saw the light from the supernova explosion before we saw it reflected off the dust ring. Astronomers using the International Ultraviolet Explorer were able to measure the time it took the light from the explosion to reach the ring to be 0 0.66 years. The diameter of the dust ring was then calculated to be 1.32 light years. More importantly, by comparing the angular and true sizes, we find the distance to SN1987A, and thus to this region of the Large Magellanic Cloud, to be about 168,000 light years. This permitted astronomers also to calibrate the luminosity of the Cepheid variable stars in the LMC. Then knowing how bright Cepheids are, we can measure the distances to many other galaxies. Because of the fixed speed of light, we were able to directly and accurately measure the distance to this supernova by using triangulation, all due to a star that exploded about 168,000 years ago. The Andromeda Galaxy is our nearest large neighbor galaxy. It and the Milky Way, together with a few others, form the local group of galaxies. Before modern-day telescopes, Andromeda was classified as a nebula and thought to be within 17,000 light years. We now know that Andromeda is a galaxy, and that it lies much farther from Earth. Andromeda and the Milky Way are approaching each other at about 100 kilometers a second, but due to the great distance between them, the eventual collision will not happen soon, as the Andromeda galaxy lies more than 2.5 million light years away. As was mentioned, the Milky Way has a diameter of roughly 100,000 light years. This means that if it was traveling at the speed of light, which it can't, but that's the maximum speed anything can travel at, 
it would take it 100,000 years to move one diameter width through space. At their current speed, it will take billions of years for this collision to take place. The Andromeda Galaxy is actually closer than it appears because we see it as it was 2.5 million years ago. Its light traveled the void of space at the fixed speed of 299,792 kilometers a second before reaching us. In the meantime, it's moved closer to us. 28 million years ago, the light we see from the Sombrero Galaxy began its long journey across space, finally reaching the lenses of our telescopes today. We can only speculate on what will happen during the collision of Andromeda and the Milky Way, but that dance is already being played out 45 million light years away. The antenna galaxies are in the midst of a massive collision and merger. The antenna galaxies appear static. During your whole life, they will appear exactly the same, but they are moving. As was previously mentioned, it takes a colossal amount of time for this process to play out. What we see is a snapshot in time, and it will take many millions of years, perhaps billions, for them to completely merge into one galaxy. NGC 5866, also known as the Spindle Galaxy, is a disk galaxy 44 million light years away that is tilted nearly edge-on to our line of sight, allowing us a clear view of the dust lane silhouetted by the bright glow of the galactic core. Another relatively close galaxy, providing us with a spectacular view, is Flocculent Spiral Galaxy NGC 4414, at 62 million light years distant. We speak of these galaxies as being relatively close to us, because on the scale of the known universe, they are indeed right in our backyard. Galaxy NGC 1300 is about 69 million light years away from us, yet it is close enough for us to image it in great detail. However, when you zoom into this Hubble image, you see that behind it are dozens of much further galaxies. They are so far away that all we can see of them are faint, grainy smudges showing galactic cores and spiral arms. We see NGC 1300 as it was 69 million years ago, but how much farther back in time do we see when we look at these more distant galaxies? How many stars are in each galaxy? How many planets? They are so far away that we will probably never know. 2.2 billion light years away lies galaxy cluster Abel 1689. This group of galaxies is so massive that it distorts and bends light from the galaxies far behind it, causing a zoom lens effect, known as gravitational lensing. Background galaxies appear as long arcs encircling the central mass of the cluster. Galaxy cluster Abel 2218 lies about 2 billion light years from us. Its enormous gravitational field deflects light rays passing through it to create this massive zoom lens effect, magnifying the galaxies behind it. The arc-shaped patterns found in this image are the distorted images of galaxies that are at least five times farther away than the lensing cluster. This effect graphically illustrates to us the fact that light traveled millions and even billions of years and was acted upon by colossal gravitational forces during its journey. From September 2003 to January 2004, the Hubble telescope was pointed at a black area of space about one-tenth the size of the full moon, with about one million seconds of viewing time at the rate of about one photon per minute for the most distant objects, a picture gradually appeared of over 10,000 galaxies. This was the deepest view of the universe ever made. Out of this dark patch of sky, seemingly empty and void of light, emerged one of the most astounding and important astronomical discoveries of all time. It is estimated that the number of stars in a galaxy varies from some tens of millions of stars for dwarf galaxies to hundreds of millions of stars, the Milky Way, to 1,900 trillion stars in some giant elliptical galaxies. The whole sky contains 12.7 million times more area than this picture. When we zoom in to individual galaxies in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, we see amazing views of individual galaxies billions of light years away. These galaxies existed in this state billions of years ago. Many of these galaxies appear chaotic and strange in their appearance, a sharp contrast to the classic spiral and elliptical galaxies we see closer to us. For millions and billions of years, light has been weaving through the universe, photon by photon in never-ending waves, snaking its way past galaxy clusters, through nebula, and straight through the black void of space, and ending up on the sensors of our best scientific instruments. In the last handful of years, we've witnessed the unfolding of an amazing story, one that has unfolded above us, stretching back through countless aeons, and by using our sight and technology, we've become the first time travelers in the history of humanity. The stars are a cosmological clock, running on a time scale that is orders of magnitudes greater than the human lifespan. In our whole lives, the stars will be exactly the same from when we were born to when we die. But they move. To us, they move slowly. But on their time scale, they swirl like water in a drain. They burn up and explode and come together from raw materials and ignite. They are like living things, and the best thing about them is that we can see it all happening. 
But the creationist will argue with all this. He will claim that God stretched out the heavens and somehow managed to do all of this within a 6,000 year constraint. Okay, so let me get this straight. Everything in the universe was compressed into a very small, dense space. All the billions of galaxies and dark matter all squished up under an unthinkable force of gravity, and then God had this mass explode and inflate into the universe we have now. Okay, so you call it God, and everyone else calls it the Big Bang. So far, so good. But then it gets weird. They want us to believe that God then magically teleported the light from these stars instantly to Earth, so we wouldn't have to wait billions of years for it all to get here. In doing so, he made it look like the light traveled for millions and billions of years. All the events we see out past 6,000 light years didn't actually happen. They're just like a movie, a, a movie God made to make it look like the universe is billions of years old. That's stupid. Can you not see how convoluted that is? Some would want us to believe that instead of that story, all of these ev events did actually happen, but before God stretched out the heavens, so all of these events happened inside a 6,000 light year bubble, and then God stretched them all out. How do you fit billions of galaxies, each tens of, and hundreds of light years across themselves, into a 6,000 light year bubble? How do you do that even with our own galaxy? This nonsensical idea can only exist within the mind of one who is absolutely and completely ignorant of all things cosmological, whose worldview is entirely inward. As Hitchens would say, take heart, the whole universe was created with you in mind. For most of human history, we thought that the stars were static and unchangeable. It was heresy to believe otherwise. God had created it that way. This is almost like the argument for kinds within young earth creationism. God created it all, just like this. To quote Anatole Friends, The appearance of a new star to the mysterious personages whom the Gospels call wise men of the East, I assume the incident to be authentic historically, was undoubtedly a miracle to the astrologers of the Middle Ages, who believed that the firmament in which the stars were stuck like nails was subject to no change whatever. But whether real or supposed, the star of the Magi has lost its miraculous character for us, who know that the heavens are incessantly perturbed by the birth and death of worlds, and who in 1866 saw a star suddenly blaze forth in the corona borealis, shine for a month, and then go out. It did not proclaim the Messiah. All it announced was that, at an infinitely remote distance from our earth, an appalling conflagration was burning up a world in a few days, or rather had burnt it up long ago, for the ray that brought us the news of this disaster in the heavens had been on the road for 500 years and possibly longer. End quote. As the heresy of the changing heavens was eventually accepted and incorporated into all belief systems, so eventually evolution will be accepted as well. It's almost the same as we see in the field of genetics, where common ancestry has been proven, but this fact is rejected in favor of the ridiculous notion that God made it look like we evolved from apes over millions of years for... what? Look, either the universe is billions of years old, as simple observation indicates, or if I grant the creationist convoluted idea that their god made it look that way, we come back to the question. If a god made the universe to look billions of years old, how can you blame anyone for believing it? The centerpiece of a popular Christian presuppositional argument is that everything you think you know could be wrong, and therefore I am just as likely to be right about my beliefs as you are in yours. Well, I, it's my position as a Christian that without God, we actually can't know anything. Would you say that we can know things, or is it impossible to know things? I know a lot of stuff. Two plus two equals four. Two plus three is five. I could go on forever doing this. Right, so we do have knowledge. Is it possible that our knowledge could be wrong? Well, of course, but you can prove it. Put two stones down there on the wall, put two beside it, count them up, it'll come to four. Put another one on there, it'll come to five. You can test it, that's evidence. And you can test any kind of a claim, if it's reasonable, a reasonable claim that can have a proof. But everything that we've tested so far, it's possible that it could all be wrong? No. It's not, impo it's not possible that what we know now could be wrong? No, not by definition. We know what two is, we know what the other two is, we know what plus means and equals, we know what that means, and we add them together, we get five. I, okay. I think he was Thank asking, you. it's possible that we 
could be wrong, and that's certainly true. We could be wrong about things. We've revised our positions in the light of new evidence. Well, but not yeah. things that are defined. Yeah, I don't think he was just talking math, though, right? You were talking in general. All, all knowledge, is it possible? Because we have to admit, out of all the knowledge in the universe, we've got a very finite amount, right? Oh, absolutely, uh, yes, very, very. So out of the vast majority that we don't have, could something out there prove wrong what we know? Oh, lots of things are proved wrong every day, of course. So everything that we know could be proven wrong. No, not everything that we know. Not everything. There is a short essay by Isaac Asimov titled The Relativity of Wrong, which speaks to this particular misunderstanding. But I would put it this way. So let's take the proposition that everything we have learned through science could be wrong. This is actually a testable hypothesis. The test is, does anything work? When we applied our scientific findings, did things get better? Well, we went to the moon, we invented computers, we improved medicine and extended the human lifespan, and on and on and on. So, one thing we know from this is that at least some things we hold as true actually are, and by extension, because I study the same things and hold them to be correct, I can be sure that I am definitely right about at least a few fundamental facts. So now that we've established that I could not possibly be wrong about everything, I would put forward a second proposal, that I can also be reasonably certain, to varying degrees, as to which aspects of my knowledge I can be more sure of regarding their truth or falsity. You see, the pipe dream promise made by religion regarding absolute certainty and knowledge can never deliver. The consequence of that belief is that humanity is filled with people who are much too sure of themselves than they should be. The best we can have, if we're honest with ourselves, are varying degrees of certainty. And science has demonstrated that it is the most reliable method. After all, religion had millennia and didn't even reveal the existence of microbes or galaxies, let alone give us medicine or rockets. <laughs>